Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Tonight, i uh, just like to start out the focus prayers tonight, talking about just being sensitive to just being sensitive to God and what He has for us. We, um, we can get busy in our day-to-day world today. It's easy to do it. We have, uh, we have things like radios take our time, phones take our time, televisions take our time, jobs take our time. A lot of things try to take our time, and it's hard for, it's hard for us sometimes to get focused in and make sure that we are listening to that still, quiet voice that is God's. And just tonight, before we just get into prayer, I would like for us just to focus on that. Let's focus on getting all of the things that's in our mind from today, maybe last week, this week, whatever's going on in your mind. Try to clear it out and let God have his way tonight. Let's, make, let's pray that we're sensitive to his will, to his calling, and what he has planned for us in this service tonight. If we could stand, let's all pray that God can help clear our minds and get us focused upon him tonight. God, I thank you, Lord, for all that you do, Jesus. Lord, we're coming to you, Jesus, Lord, that you can help us clear our minds, Jesus, Lord, that we're able to focus upon you, Jesus. Lord, that we, that, Lord, that we follow your will tonight, God. Lord, that your will be done in this place, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for all that you do, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for giving us ease and peace, God. Lord, to help us through, Lord, whatever's happened in our week, Jesus. But, Lord, you can touch and bless, God. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you, Jesus. If we could, let's just give God a hand clap of praise tonight. God, I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you'll go ahead and remain standing, we have one more focused prayer here. Now, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I actually really like this time of year. Do you agree? Does anybody else like this, this time of the year, Thanksgiving and Christmas, when you get a lot of food? Normally, you're going to get some gifts. You know, you get this nice cold weather. Does anybody like that? It was like it was like 60 degrees in our house last night. That was great. I love it cold. I kid you not. Uh, but it was cold. But you know, for some of us, it's also a really sh- extremely stressful time of year because we have the rush of getting gifts, and we have to make sure we have enough money to buy everything, everybody gifts. Then we have these family dinners. Then you have to see those family members at these dinners. But you get really caught up in all this stuff, and it's easy to become really, really stressful during, during this time of year. And it's kind of hard to enjoy, and before you know it, it's over, and then you're starting back at the first of the year again. But one thing in um, Philippians 4 and 6, it actually says, do not be anxious or worried about anything. Because you see, during this time of year, we have to make sure we keep our focus on what's really important. And that's Jesus coming to earth. And during these next few months, we're going to have time to spend with family, see people we haven't seen before. And so we need to make sure that during this time, why it may be stressful, why it may be easy to get caught up in all this stuff, we have to make sure we maintain the right focus on what's important. So if we could, I just want us to make that our prayer tonight, that we would keep that our, our focus, that what's really important during this holiday season, that we would maintain that as our focus. If we can make that our prayer right now. Jesus, we thank you for this time of year that you've given us, this, this year of giving gifts and, and dinners and seeing our family. But God, we know that there, there's some people tonight that may be feeling the pressure of this holiday season. It might be feeling like they're rushing, but God, we're asking that you would give us peace during this time, that we would maintain the focus of what's really important during this time of year. God, we thank you you for everything you've given us God we thank you for our family and we're just asking that you would give peace to those that may be feeling the rush and we thank you tonight in Jesus name in Jesus name we pray you may be seated praise God thank you so much for being here in Harvest uh, Church tonight and in our midweek refresh we call it refresh because right in the middle of your week sometimes uh, we just need to be refreshed and it's a perfect time to come and uh, I don't know about you, but I've had those weeks that when Wednesday got there, I was hoping it was Friday, you know, it was one of those things that weeks can drag out. But, you know, a midweek worship experience like this can uh, kind of rejuvenate us. It's kind of like when you've put in a full day or you feel like you've put in a full day and you go to the water cooler or you find some good cold water and you take that drink. It's just something about that that helps you go ahead and push on through to bedtime or whatever, you know. You're trying to make it through to the end of that day. That's kind of the idea of our midweek refresh services, that when we come in the middle of the week, 
We want God to be able just to kind of, if you've had a bad week, the Lord can lift your spirits and keep you uh, with your focus on Him and that sort of thing. And tonight, uh, that's what we're praying this service can do. And we're going to pray that that service would meet that need tonight, that if you come in weary, whether it's in body or spirit, the Lord can touch. Now, we want to talk about a few needs tonight before we go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, they're going to go ahead and project that prayer list, and we'll stand in just a moment. I know you've been standing for a little while here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. A couple of things that I want to mention. First off, uh, Brother James Brown is in need of prayer. Uh, I know he may have went back to work. I'm not sure he did go back. I know when I talked to him yesterday, he did sound good on the phone. He'd had some tests run, and then uh, a little bit of something that came kind of as an, a side effect from those tests. And so we're just praying for Brother James Brown tonight that the Lord would touch his body. Also, uh, Patricia Watkins, this is a lady we prayed about at our Harvest Connect. She's got cancer and uh, she's going to have to have surgery coming up December the 7th. And so uh, we're continuing to remember her in prayer. And then also Sister Laura Warnicky, uh, they took her to the emergency room. It was earlier uh, in the week uh, and I think it was on Monday, I believe it was. And uh, she had a really high fever. Uh, they said she had pleurisy and infection. Uh, they sent her home. And then uh, the fever came down. Well, then earlier this afternoon, fever started rising again. They've taken her, they've taken her back to the ER. Uh, I got a text right before church. Uh, flu season is here. And uh, she also has type A flu on top of all of that. So she is in need of prayer. Now, the last I heard was she did not want to be admitted into the hospital. So she's probably going to be going home. And uh, at first I had said I was going to be going by and having prayer with them after service. But if it's something like that, I said, I do believe the Lord's able to touch and we can pray and God work there. And uh, so I've, I've told them that's what we're going to do tonight. And I appreciate you helping us pray for that. I know um, we've got a Christmas drama that's coming up. And sometimes, and maybe everybody doesn't see the importance of something like this. You'll have people in this community. I could name people right now. That I won't do that. Uh, for the sake of live stream and that sort of thing and not knowing how, how many people would watch this service even after this is over tonight. But uh, I, I know people in this community that go to other churches that they don't come any other time of the year, but we get one chance a year to minister to them people. It's kind of like those folks, that, and, and, and not these people that I'm talking about now, but you know there's some people, they go to church pretty much... Uh, I think it's a, three times a year. They go Mother's Day, Christmas, and Easter. You know they're going to be at church those times. Well, I've got people in this community that I know are going to be here at Christmas dramas. I never will forget, and, and, and it started in a Christmas drama, and I can mention this one because I've, I've had conversations with them and actually had asked for permission to use it in a sermon one time. Philip Weaver's wife. Uh, I never will forget it. It was a Christmas drama. We were. It was probably Brother Justin, one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. Some of the stuff that happened, it was hilarious, but some of the drama was just downright slapstick and some of it just downright ignorant that would just make you laugh. And it was the old folks home, the nursing home, and, and, and we had the biggest time with that that night. And I get up to dismiss the drama and I look back and his wife is just boohooing. I could tell she wasn't laughing it wasn't one of those things where she had laughed so hard she was crying. But the message of the drama had finally gripped her heart. And uh, she eventually would go on and be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in another church. So we don't know the impact that a Friday night and Saturday night, December 7th and 8th, is going to have on lives. We may not see. All 200 of them come back to church here on Sunday. But even if they go somewhere else and the Lord fills them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have played a part as a local congregation and opening up your doors. And we talk about this as a cast a lot. You're preaching the sermon that night. You're, you're delivering the message. And this year, the message of the drama is centered around the song, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. What happened when Jesus came? What did he bring? There are people in our world today, they need to know there is hope for them they need to know that they can have faith just like we had faith in God and God can fill them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost 
And so this drama can be very evangelistic. But I don't want us just to go through the motions of a drama. I want us to pray tonight that the Lord would cover this next week. And uh, I know the cast would appreciate you praying for them. There's a lot of lines that they got to remember. But beyond just remembering the lines, if we don't get every line right, just as long as the message of the drama gets forth and these people understand the word of God and it touches a heart, that's going to make it all worthwhile. Let's stand together tonight. Let's pray for these things. I believe God's going to work. We're looking forward to this service tonight. Don't forget to pray for this service as well. Let's pray together right now. Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight. Lord, we know Brother Brown is in need of prayer this evening. God, you're able, Lord, to touch and give that complete touch of healing. I pray for Patricia Watkins as well this evening. Going to have cancer surgery on December 7th. Touch her body, I pray, Lord. I pray for Sister Laura this evening. Lord, in, in a very miserable and in a very uh, bad condition tonight. And Lord, we're praying that you would touch her body. That you would go, Lord, on that dress drive and God you're able to go into that home where she's at and touch her this very night. God I pray for every need that's represented on this board tonight. I pray God that you would touch. We pray for Linda Johnson and others that are on this prayer request board tonight God. You know individually what we have need of. We pray for this Christmas drama musical even though we may not know who's coming. Lord you know who will be here and we pray God that you would touch them and minister Lord through that weekend. Anoint Brother Cook as he will sing and minister every night of the drama and also on that Sunday following. I'm believing God for a mighty outpour of your spirit. I pray for this service tonight. Prepare our hearts to worship you, I pray. God, help us, Lord, to come into this place tonight with an atmosphere, Lord, of praise and worship, Lord, to cultivate in our midst. God, help us today to focus upon you, as Brother Justin said, and to allow you to work, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord together for his presence. God, I worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. God bless you. If the ushers would come, there was one thing that, um, I, I love what Andrew had to say, but there's one thing that he forgot that I absolutely love this time of year. Children's drama. Who likes children's dramas? I got two in the back that love children's dramas. Awesome. But I remember so many times being a child coming around this time of year going into Christmas dramas and they were some of my favorite things to do I've always liked acting but there was something about Christmas dramas talking about the name of Jesus there is one Christmas drama that has always stuck with me and that was one year we did a Christmas drama where there was a visiting king who was going to Bethlehem because he heard that the newborn king has been born but he didn't know what the name was going to be so throughout the whole entire play he was trying to come up with names who what are they going to name this baby and then we finally heard his name is Jesus He's going to be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Almighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. You know, as a kid, we're teaching these kids back in the back, you know, that there is something about that name, Jesus. And when you give to Sunday School Offering, you're not just giving so they can have materials, but you're giving so that the Word can be instilled in their hearts. The Bible says to train up a child in the way that they should go, that when they are older, they will not depart from it. There's something powerful about God's Word with children. Jesus loved children so much that he said, suffer the children to come unto me. So if we can go to the Lord in prayer tonight and ask him to bless the Sunday school offering tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything you've done, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the wonderful things you've taught us, Lord Jesus, whenever we were children, Lord God. The wonderful opportunities that we had, Lord God, to be in Sunday school classes, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you move upon our Sunday school teachers, Lord Jesus. That you help them, Lord Jesus, each and every Sunday, Lord God, and those teachers on Wednesdays, Lord Jesus. That you help them teach these kids, Lord Jesus, who you are and how much you love them and how much... You have a plan for them. And how much your plan for them is for them, Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord God, that you move in a mighty way. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you bless this offering for the furthering of your kingdom. And we're going to give you all praise and all glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. They're coming to you tonight. God bless you. Thank you for giving. We want to worship the Lord together in music and song. Let us sing together. Heavenly home is bright and fair. Oh, I feel like traveling on. No pain, no death can enter there. Oh, I feel like traveling on. Oh, I feel like traveling on. Oh, I feel like traveling on.
the glittering towers, the sun outside. Oh, I feel like traveling on. The heavenly mansion will be mine. Oh, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. Oh, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Oh, I feel like traveling on. Let others seek a home below. Oh, but I feel like traveling home. Which flames devour. Oh, I feel like traveling on. Oh, I feel like traveling on. Oh, I feel like traveling on. I'm traveling on. My heavenly home is fine and fair. Oh, I feel like traveling on. You know the Lord has been so good to me. Yes, I Oh, I like this. Until the blessed face I see. Oh, I feel like traveling oh, oh, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like about it. We're going to take a trip. Well, I have good news to bring. Oh, but that is why I sing all my joy with you. I'm going to share. I'm going to take a trip in that good old gospel ship and go sailing through the air. Wait, uh, I know I'll not be late for I spend uh, my time in prayer. And when my ship comes in, I'm going to leave this world of sin and go sailing through the air. Shame to me, you have no 
no cost to me For with Christ I am the man If too much salt you find You'll surely be left behind While I go sailing through the air To bring, and that is why I sing all my joy with you. I'm gonna share. I gotta tell you, I'm gonna take a trip in the good old gospel ship, and I'm going sailing through the air. Somebody praise him. How we looking forward to that great day? Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We talk about the birth of Christ this time of year. I'm glad that he came. I'm glad that he was born in that manger. But I'm also glad that he gave his life for you and I, that our sins could be forgiven. His blood is what has remitted our sins. And we are washed, they're washed away in baptism. But I'm so glad he came up on that third day. That's where our new life comes in. How great is our God. Let's sing it together. The splendor of the Somebody would magnify the Lord with me. Sing it, operate.
shouts the praises of his people tonight. Oh, let's sing how great, how great. He's worthy. Would you sing it with us right now? serve a great God, great in what we would look at as size, but also great in how good he's been to us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Thank you for your worship in the house of the Lord. If you need one of those handouts to go along with the lesson, if you would just raise your hand. Brother Amos is going to help us there. It looks like uh, Danny. and We've got some also on this side that Bivens is as well. And uh, if you need one of those, they can help you out there and we'll get right into this tonight. And uh, looking forward to Sunday, um, if you need an ink pen as well, I know James has those and he can help us out this evening. Uh, appreciate you coming on a Wednesday night. Uh, looking forward to Sunday, the Johnson family. I don't think we've ever had them. Um, they are, at first I thought he said Ethiopia, but he, he told me when he got here, um, maybe we was originally supposed to have some people from Ethiopia, but uh, he was telling me, he said, you know, Pastor, he said, we're normally in Africa, and this cold weather's about to kill us, he said. So uh, I cranked the heat up a little bit more for them, Sister Jeanette. It, it's roasting in my office right now, so I don't sit in there. I sit out here and study. So, uh, But, yeah, uh, they're enjoying uh, the amenities of some heat because they don't take this cold weather. Over in Africa, it don't get this cold. It just don't do it. It don't matter if it's winter or summer. It don't get this cold. So uh, they are in... Uh, oh my, I can't remember where he said they were tonight. Um, uh, then they're going to be with Union City tomorrow. And I think Sunday night, they're going to be at Souls Harbor. They're going to be with us Sunday morning. And uh, pray for them because he's telling me they're going to drive all night Sunday night. And this is an older couple. They're going to drive all night Sunday night because he flies back to Africa. I think he told me on Wednesday from Texas. And so they're going to drive all the way to Texas at night and uh, get there and try to, he's got to get his suitcases and all ready for an airplane. You don't, you don't just pack your suitcase and jump on an airplane. you got to make sure it don't weigh a certain amount and everything's tidy for them to go through it and mess it up, you know. So if you've ever flown before, you know what I'm talking about. It's an interesting situation. So uh, keep them in your prayers as the Lord would keep his hand on them as they travel Sunday night. And uh, it will be late, late in the night. Matter of fact, the way he put it to me is about daylight we'll be pulling up to where we're supposed to be. And I thought, mm, mercy, mercy. Uh, I do a little better driving in the daytime than I do nighttime. So, well, tonight we're going to get into an interesting subject. And uh, I'm, I'm going to deal with this probably in a little bit of a different manner than I ever have before. 
I was talking to Brother Andrew before church. I um, knew this day would come because of technology the way it is. Um, as technology changes, our approach to technology has to change. The principle stays the same. Um, and so I'm going to apply the same principle that I've been asking in one area in regards to technology. I'm going to ask that in another area tonight that maybe we've never delved as much into. There's going to be a point in this lesson tonight that I'm going to even hone in on us as parents with young people in our house because some of us adults, technology may not affect us like it does young people. You know, you know when to turn Facebook off. Young people have to be told, get off Facebook and talk to me. <laughs> you know, um, my little girl, she's, if you see her walking around with a cell phone, the only way that cell phone works is if there's Wi-Fi. All right? And even when there's Wi-Fi, she don't know the password to the Wi-Fi. And I've made it to where it does not... Um, automatically remember that password. Why? Because I want to have control over when she's doing what she's doing. So we're going to talk some practical things tonight. Now, if you're an older adult and you don't have kids at home, you can get real loud and amen at that point. So uh, I'm just going to deal with those things for a little bit tonight. It's very crucial. Um, it's very, very crucial because we, we've got to be wise and vigilant, but yet the same principles apply. I think it's important for our young people to see the Word of God doesn't change, so we're going to apply some principles that we've always been living to some new things that are trying to come up. So um, the greatest tool that Satan has ever had is modern media. Boy, we could just close up right there. It has been the single most effective cultural thermostat there is. The difference simply... Uh, there, there, there is a difference between the thermometer and the thermostat. And I said, media is the thermostat. All right? Thermometer simply measures the temperature, but the thermostat, sim uh, or, or the thermostat actually sets the temperature. Television, movies, magazines, books, internet, and radio have radically changed the culture in which we live today. And I, I might should just add the smartphone into that list. And probably I should have typed that in, but... Every day, the devil blasts his message through every, vo every form of media that he can find. Amen. I mean, Brother Charles, I can't even enter a store today without hearing some kind of music. It's just there. Or sometimes, I don't even have to go into a store to see his message. Right there on a billboard. Our children, our teens, and even us as adults are becoming desensitized by the bombarding messages of premarital sex, homosexuality, violence, and even self-gratification. So it is vital. It is very important. Everybody say it's important that we keep our hearts right with God. And I'm going to tell you the way we do that, one way we're going to do that is limiting our intake of some media. Job 31.1 explains it best by saying a principle. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Do not answer this out loud because my fear is one person would answer it one way and another person would answer it another way. And then we get into a debate, and I don't want that. Is sin in technology? What is worse, television or a telephone? Well, let me say this, and this is your next blank. Technology is not the problem. The problem is the heart of man. You know, Brother Amos, if technology was the problem, Eve wouldn't have sinned. She committed the first sin before the first bit of technology ever came about. She didn't have a television. She didn't have a telephone. Andy Griffith would say she didn't have a telefloid. I don't know if y'all have ever seen that one or not. It's a pretty funny episode. The heart is wicked. She didn't have a cosmop uh, Cosmopolitan magazine. Now that goes back a little ways, don't it? She didn't have none of that. If your heart is wicked, what's going to happen? You're going to find a way to sin with or without technology. So a lot of folks, you know, they don't have televisions. However, they got telephones and they're tearing down a lot more than what television ever has. Man has been sinning from the beginning is my point, okay? So we've got to make a choice to commit ourselves to the Lord completely and subject our flesh to what we know is right. 
We have to guard our minds. We have to guard our hearts, our ears, and our eyes from sin that is made accessible to us from all types of media. I'm talking telephone, television, computer, magazines, and books. All of these can be abused. Remember that change begins inwardly, but it produces fruit outwardly. Psalm 101 verse 3, David says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I think it's interesting he talks about setting something before his eyes and then something not cleaving to him. He's saying, I'm not going to put something before me because I don't want it to attach itself to me. That term wicked, it's interpreted in the Hebrew to mean Thing of Belial or Satan. Now, Brother Danny, I don't think we have to pick up a book. I don't think we have to get on a computer. I don't think we have to turn the television on. I don't think you have to pick up a, a magazine or even get on the telephone to understand that all of these things can be tools of Satan. They can be. I mean, something as simple as a telephone. And before they even turned it into a smartphone, that telephone still had some evil to it. Anybody remember the party line? All that was for was gossip, wasn't it? Boy, they'd pick it up and listen. It was just as evil. God doesn't rank sin. He just says sin is sin. So we're still dealing with a sin issue, folks. That's, that's what I'm talking about tonight. And I, I hope you didn't expect me to come in here and just blast technology tonight because I'm not going to do it. We're live on the web right now. I mean, I would be, I would be a hypocrite to sit here and, and, and just go blasting technology when we're sitting there live on the internet and people watching service right now. Now, the enemy uses things to promote his ideology and doctrine. That same internet, we're broadcasting the gospel and the truth on tonight. The internet, the, the evil is there as well and the devil's using it. So the Apostle Paul, he's real clear on what we need to be focusing our mind on. Philippians 4 and 8. Let's read it together. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what does he say? Think on these things. That's telling me our job is to keep our mind under control and subjected to the Spirit of God. Psalm 119.37, David prays. He says, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. In other words, I need the help of the Lord in my life to be able to overcome the influence of this world. Isaiah explained that by guarding our eyes and ears, it would actually, that, 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 that we could actually dwell in the presence of God and have a strong defense and be sustained with bread and be sure in the Lord. Isaiah 33, 15, 16, he says, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. And then look at this, he says, And shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Look at this. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. What this is doing, here's your next blank. This scripture indicates that we make the choice to participate in or to abstain from these evils. Now, there's a lot of media outlets that we could participate in, and perhaps certain media outlets would not be sin. However, let me say this tonight, in everything we're doing, we are a witness of the Almighty God. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, it tells us, abstain from the very appearance of evil. I believe we've got to be careful that our witness does not receive irreparable damage because of our actions. So the condition of the inside, or we've talked about the inward man, is reflected in our outward man. Now, I'm not reading these passages for sake of time tonight because I have a lot of material to cover. But in Matthew 15 and in Mark chapter 7, Jesus explains that things from within come out and they defile us. Now, a list of those items, he says, comes from within an unguarded heart and they proceed out. He says that list is evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Man, that's like reading the latest movie script from Hollywood, isn't it? We've got, boy, it just got quiet right there, didn't it? We've got to be wiser than a serpent 
and understand that all these things are simply tools for Satan to plant his ideology in the hearts and minds of men. Now, it wasn't too long ago, supposed to be an innocent children's film, and they was working this global warming garbage right into the middle of it. And you thought you was just feeding your kid a little simple, innocent film, and they was sliding a message in there that you didn't realize. Now, that's something that, you know, global warming, I don't think, I don't think going to go to hell thinking there's global warming. But what I'm saying is, if they'll do something with something as innocent as that, what are they doing with other stuff? I don't know if y'all heard about it. I didn't see it. Obviously, I don't have it, and I don't watch it. But um, apparently, the Thanksgiving parade was completely different this year. And something happened right in front of kids that were watching that parade where two people of the same sex would embrace right in front of everybody and it was supposed to just be normal and nobody say anything about it. This is the kind of stuff that they're, that's supposed to be a family thing. But we're sliding messages in and our kids are not stupid. They're picking up on it. And if, if the enemy can get a person full of these sinful ideas, then that person eventually is going to produce those ideas Outwardly. Proverbs 23, 7 confirms that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So the world understands the power of what we see. That, that's why we have sayings like the eyes are the windows of the soul or a picture is worth a thousand words. We can see the power of what we see in the coverage of World War I and II in the Gulf and Iraqi wars. Modern America, we can see battles as if, they're, as if we are there via television and magazines and websites instead of waiting months to see a, a grainy black and white image of what's happened on the other side of the world. Now we see it almost immediately. We are bombarded every day with images and we've we got to make sure we're following Paul's advice or we absorbing information that's true. Listen, just because you saw it on Facebook and it looked like a news site don't mean it's real. <laughs> Wait till election time comes back around. You'll understand what I'm talking about. Some of that stuff that even got told on the opposite side, it was crazy. It wasn't real. We got to make sure we're reading stuff that's true, that's honest, that is pure, lovely, and of a good report. So this applies to social media as well as anything else that we do. Let's take a look at the history of radio, television, and movies. These were created with good intentions, improving communications. They were intended to bring people from all over the world closer together by being able to communicate faster and clearer. Example, radio was used to tell America Japan had just bombed Pearl Harbor. Television was the first to send images of a man walking on the moon. Even documentary films have shared the images of Nazi death camps during World War II. Now, television was first seen in 1939 at the World Fair, but regularly broadcasted, did not broadcast programming till. I think it was the 1940s, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, at first, uh, no one thought television was going to be a big deal. Um, but quickly, people began to change their minds. And so by 1950, I think it's in your handout, in the 1950s, you had teachers, parents, social scientists putting out a statement warning against the violence that could be seen on TV. I'm amazed. They were so concerned about the state of television in the 1950s. What would those same people say today? Our society has become so consumed by this media. The following are just a few alarming statistics concerning television. During the elementary years of a child, they will have seen over 20,000 murders and 80,000 other assaults. By the time a student graduates high school, they will have spent 11,000 hours in school and 15,000 hours watching TV, according to the average. Students who are heavy TV watchers, this is four or more hours per day are poor readers, bad students, don't play well with friends, and have fewer hobbies and activities and are more likely to be overweight. I'm just reading you the statistics. 20 to 25 violent acts will be committed every hour on Saturday morning children's programming. Used to, preachers could preach an hour and a half, two hours, nobody would say anything about it. TV has shortened our attention spans. <laughs> and now they tell us, if you're going to get your message across, you better do it in 30 minutes because people are going to check out on you. And then lastly, and this applies to other forms of media, I'm just focusing in on this right now, but TV is also a thief of time. The average person, they tell us, in the United States watches 50,000 to 75,000 hours of TV in a lifetime. That is five to eight years of their life spent in front of a tube. 
Social scientists have identified three effects of television violence. Number one, you become less sensitive to pain and suffering in others because you very rarely can turn on a program you don't see somebody hurting and suffering of something. They're more fearful of the world around them and they're more aggressive and more likely to harm others. That's just according to social scientists. Television is sending an immoral message to our children today. It says that homosexuality is just another lifestyle and it can even be funny. There is nothing funny about the homosexual lifestyle. And what they're doing is they're leaving out the horrors of AIDS and the loneliness of the homosexual lifestyle. And yet this is one of the most popular causes promoted by these actors and sitcoms. Slowly and surely, the television is desensitizing our children to the consequences of the homosexual lifestyle. The media in general, in general, I'm not even just talking about TV right now. The media in general advocates for premarital sex, which is fornication according to the Bible, and teaches our children that it's okay and safe. It's taught in school. It's taught through the media that there are no consequences for fornicating as long as you use a certain object. And it makes those who remain pure seem not normal and weird. Every night on television, there are numerous people engaging in this behavior. What example do we want our children to follow? So what I'm saying is, if you have one in your home, please have control over what is being shown as well as other media. And I'm going to hone in on computer in just a minute, so I'm not leaving the internet out, believe me. The media tells us that adultery and multiple relationships are part of a normal life. It doesn't expose the emotional damage adultery produces in a marriage and in the lives of the children involved. Instead, it gives awards to soap opera stars who have been married nine times or more on their shows. And we've got to see the danger we got to see the danger, folks, of allowing our lives to be consumed by this ideology. Now, when discussing media, I also must talk about the Internet. So here we go. First off, every home ought to have a pop-up blocker. Amen. That way, nothing just happens to come up on your screen. Let me say this. Just because you've got a pop-up blocker, users can still access evil. But it goes back to the heart. Okay? We've got to recognize there's still much more good to do through the Internet than evil. And I know there's going to be somebody say tonight, well, the Internet's just as bad as, hold on just a minute. When you go to the statistics, I'm going to show it in just a minute. You go to the statistics, the majority of the websites out there are not pornography. Okay? You do have to go looking for it if you have a pop-up blocker. So we've got to recognize, to, to, to say otherwise, simply means we're not educated in the main purpose and design of the Internet. Here's an example. In a remote village in India, a farmer checks the price of soybeans in Chicago of the United States of America, and he determines the best time to sell his crop. At the same moment, a, a pensioner smiles as she reads an e email from her grandson. A traveler sees the weather forecast at his destination, and a mother finds helpful material for her child's homework because she's worked all day, and Brother Andrew and them have already closed the library, but they have an Internet at home, and they can still do their son's homework even though the library is closed. All of this that I just described to you happens because the Internet is available. An estimated 600 million people connect worldwide. The Internet revolution has transformed the way the world communicates and does business. Increasingly, students use it to replace the library as a primary source of news and research. And now the libraries have learned if we're going to stay in business, we've got to put computers in the lobbies of the library and hire Brother Andrew to come when people don't know how to use them. <laughs> so basically, the libraries are adapting now. I'm not saying people don't check out books, but here's what Dr. Uh, Deanna L. Tish, she's director of study involving college seniors in the United States, she said, in a nutshell, these students are virtually 100% connected. Yes, the Internet is a valuable tool in our modern society. It's a powerful tool. And generally, the more powerful a tool is, the more dangerous it can be. I was hoping Brother Edward would be here tonight. I know he's, got to, he's had to work over this evening. He's having a hard time getting in. Sister Annette was sick. But he could even testify to the fact a gas-powered chainsaw, and, and anybody in this room probably would know this, but a gas-powered chainsaw is going to accomplish a whole lot more, a whole lot quicker than one of the old-fashioned hand saws. It's more powerful. It can also be more dangerous so let's apply this I'm talking principles tonight we're getting very practical the internet is very powerful and useful but you better be careful 
because it also brings danger. And there are concerns about these dangers that has caused more than 40 member nations of the Council of Europe to draft an international treaty that is aimed at the protection of society against cyber crime. Why is all the concern? What are some of the dangers that are particularly concerning to Christians? Should they, should they cause you to avoid using the internet? What guidance does the Bible provide? Hopefully I can give you something here. Centuries ago, the Bible warned of dangers that were posed by evil men and they were described as masters at evil ideas and scheming to do bad according to Proverbs 24 and 8. The prophet Jeremiah described them as wicked men whose houses are full of deception. Like bird catchers, Jeremiah said they set a trap to catch men and gain riches. So technology has provided modern day wicked men with deceptive traps of new dimensions. So I want you to consider some schemes that can present grave dangers for Christians. Obviously, the obvious one, internet pornography. It has become a $2.5 billion a year industry. The number of pornographic web pages has the number rather of pornographic web pages have grown at the explosive rate of nearly 1,800% over the last five years. It still does not come close to the good websites that are out there, but it is growing. Like wicked men in Bible times, pornographers frequently employ or use deception. So it's estimated that as part of an aggressive effort to attract new customers, some 2 billion pornographic emails are sent every day. You don't even have to go on the World Wide Web to get pornographic stuff. Now, thank God for spam folders that are automatically installed that I don't even go through that. I look and see, it, like, it'll tell you where it's from without even clicking it and opening it. If I don't know who it's from and they didn't tell me, hey, pastor, or somebody calls me and say, hey, I'm with such and such and I don't know you, but I'm sending you an ad of, of something that might help you with the church. If I don't get that call, I don't open the email. Why? Because now, just like you're, you're annoyed with telemarketers, I get annoyed with all this trash spam email that's trying to come through. Don't open it. They've already got a blocker and everything already installed on your computer. Use it. So... Opening one of these will lodge a barrage of immoral images that you cannot stop without turning the computer physically off. Requests can be removed from the mailing list, but you know what that does? Sometimes that's like shooting a bunch of bullets out and it causes more emails to come. A bird catcher carefully places seed along a path. The unsuspecting bird pecks at one tasty seed until another, uh, after another until snap, the trap is sprung. Similarly, curiosity leads some people to nibble at sexually stimulating imagery. Well, it ain't pornography. Well, hold on. Where is it leading you? The viewers hope nobody's watching. They find it arousing. Some return to exciting and powerful imagery with increasing frequency. Shame and guilt plague them. And in time, what was once just a nibble has now become the ordinary addiction. And for those that are inclined to view pornography, the internet is like fertilizer that causes desires rapidly to grow into what James would say is sinful actions. And eventually, these individuals develop a dark side. Oh, they learn to act normal in public, but they got to get their fix. So they got a dark side. Dr. Victor Klein said their core is antisocial lust and it's devoid of values. So after we assess the dangers, some people have concluded, well, it's just better for me not to have internet altogether. I'm not telling you not to have internet. I'm not telling you not to have TV. I'm telling you, you need to make a covenant with your eyes and put some practical things in place and say, I'm not going to allow these kind of things to happen in my home. Now, if you're going to allow kids to be on the internet, uh, it's your call, but I, I would recommend that you know at all times what they're doing because it's so easy for them to hide and delete cookies. You say, well, I can go on there afterwards. You can, but will you really go to the trouble of calling your Internet provider and asking for that printout? Um, it must be acknowledged that only a small percentage of sites on the Internet pose a danger. 
most users have not experienced serious problems. Thankfully, the scriptures provide guidance to safeguard us from danger. We're encouraged. You need to acquire knowledge. You need to get wisdom. And you need a thinking ability. And these qualities will keep guard over us to deliver us from the bad way, is what Proverbs says. But wisdom itself, from where does it come? Asked God's ancient servant Job. What was his answer? The Lord said, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. In other words, don't go on a website that you would not go on if the Lord wasn't sitting there beside you. Don't watch a TV program if you wouldn't invite Jesus Christ to come over and sit on the edge of the couch and eat popcorn with you and watch the film. It's that simple. We try to make this so hard. The fear of the Lord, you know what that means? Hating bad. It's the basis of developing godly attributes. Love and reverence God along with a healthy respect for His power and authority results in our hating and avoiding the bad things He hates. So users of the internet, please be aware of the dangers. Be resolved to keep God's commandments and avoid flirting with trouble. Then if internet dangers confront you, you will wisely flee from them. So this is the part I said I was going to talk to some parents real quick. There are six dangers of the internet for youth. I've said already pornography. I'm not going to spend a long time there warping minds. I've gave you a paragraph. We do have a problem with pornography in America. And in our nation alone, I've got you four statistics real quick. More than one in eight web searches are for erotic content today. Not because the sites are more plenteous than the good wholesome sites. It's because people are looking for it. Ugh. 75% of youth's exposure to internet porn takes place in their own house. <laughs> Steve, you know what that makes me ask? Where are the parents? If they're... <laughs> Ain't that the truth? He said they're watching TV. They have no clue that their kids are looking up horrible stuff. Mom and dad know where your kids are going on the internet and what they're looking at. Know what shows they're keeping up with on TV. Before the age of 18, this blew me away, 83% of boys and 57% of girls have seen group sex online. Now this affects all of us. Out of 10, one out of 10 families in America has been affected by porn already. This is a problem in America. Sexting. It's the unsafe, safe sex. That's the term today. The unsafe, safe sex. Sexting is sending or receiving nude or partially nude photos or videos through the internet or cell phones. When this behavior happens, many things go wrong. I could name apps that they're using today, parents, and they're hiding it from you. Know what your kids are doing. And really that applies to adults too. There's people that are adults that are, that are addicted to this as well. Predators, those seeking to ensnare our children online. The internet is a perfect forum to meet new people, but some with malicious intent can use to befriend your child. Um, now, internet predators are expert manipulators. What they do, they will foster a relationship of dependence with a teenager. A lot of times they will prey on a teen's desire to be liked. Because, you know, they're in a weird stage. They... they they're, they they have a desire for romance, but they don't know how to be romantic. They're at a weird stage in life. Okay? They have a sexual curiosity, and there are predators that will prey upon all three of those things. And there are many times that these turn into offline relationships. They start online and then say, well, why don't you meet me? Then you got kidnapping and abductions that happen. It's not safe. Number four, boy, it's going to feel like I'm a killjoy right here. Gaming. More risks of exposure to sexual media and interactions. I'm not just talking Xbox, PlayStation, and all this stuff. I'm talking about even apps on your phone, kids playing people. They have no clue who they are. You can't even play Yahtzee today without there being a chat window that you can have pop up. Yahtzee. Why? There's predators out there that will use that stuff. So while online and, cons and console games and even apps on your phone can be fun, they can be educational, they can be interactive, I'm not preaching against those things. Just know there are hidden dangers that are there that you need to keep an eye on. Much of the content in some games 
Uh, I don't even recommend these games. But there's some games that they have hidden things in them that have sexual content, violence, crude language. We don't need that in the heart of our children. Plus, Internet-connected games enable kids to interact with strangers. 82% of children say they are current gamers. One-third of teen gamers, 15 to 17 years old, report playing games with people they first met online. 13% of underage teenagers were able to buy mature-rated games between November of 2017 and January of 2018. Number five, social networking. It's redefining privacy. Social networks like Facebook, very popular. Um, actually, Facebook is not as popular with kids these days. So you know why? Because mom and dad got on Facebook. So now they're going to other things because they don't want mom and dad to watch what they're doing. Because if they post something stupid on Facebook, what's going to happen? Mom and dad's account's going to see it. So now they got Snapchat and you can't see it. Well, glory. I'm not going to start naming them because I, I could really get in trouble here. But there are plenty of them out there. And, oh, Jesus. Despite the 13-year minimum on Facebook, there's a whole lot of people on there that is not 13. It's not wise. Over half of parents of 12-year-olds saw their child has a Facebook account and they didn't know it. Three-fourths. <coughs> Three-fourths of parents helped their child create the account. What are we thinking? 40% of teens have seen pictures on social networks of their peers getting drunk, passed out, using drugs, and half of these first saw these pictures when they were 13 or younger. What's that going to make them think it's okay to do? Go get drunk. Pass out, use drugs. Okay, More than 11% of teens are hyper-networkers. You know what that means? They're spending more than three hours per school day on social networking sites. Friend, when I was in school, I didn't have three hours a day to spend on it. Because <laughs> my parents kept me busy. We was in Bible quizzing. Mom and Dad said, you're old enough to push a lawnmower. You're responsible for mowing the yard. You got chores after supper. One of you is going to clean the dishes off the table and put it in the sink. Or put them in the dishwasher. The other one's going to get the garbage, take it outside. you got things to do. The problem is today is we're not teaching our kids responsibility. Amen. So now they got all this time. What do we used to say? Idle mind? It's a devil's workshop. The last one, and this is going to sound so funny, because right now we're broadcasting through this very thing right now. It's got good to it. I mean, my God, if something goes wrong with your car, you can go to YouTube and watch how to fix it. But there's junk on YouTube. Harvest Church ain't one up when we're broadcasting right now. It's one of the largest video sharing sites right now. Look at this. But anybody can upload anything to YouTube. You say, well, they got guidelines. It takes them a while to catch it. And before they can catch it, people have already watched it. 48 hours of video are uploaded, uploaded to YouTube every minute. You know what that is? About eight years of content being uploaded a day. Over 3 billion videos are viewed every day on YouTube. Users upload the equivalent of 240,000 full-length films every week. So why do I say all that? The key to all media is the heart. Because I can point to the telephone. I mean, I could, I could have took an hour and just taught on the telephone and how that there's evils there. I could have took an hour and taught on television and how that there's evils there. I could take an hour and, and spend on, on, on uh, Internet. I could talk about magazines that are still in Walmart right there by the checkout because they couldn't get you to go to the actual section that was marked magazines. So now they do away with that section and they put it right by the blasted checkout so that you'll buy it, and so that you'll look at it, and so you'll read all the lies and manipulations. Half that stuff ain't true. It's tabloids. As your pastor, I cannot write laws of holiness in your heart. I had, it, it, was, it was a little over a year ago. That person still don't like me. I had an argument with them because I was supposed to go into every home and police. I ain't doing that. You need to develop a walk with God. Pastor does not need to have to have the ruler and have to slap you on the hand to let you know that it's not right. You need the Holy Ghost. 
and let the Holy Ghost help you. Now, does that mean there's not a place for the pastor to sometimes step up and say, hey, folks, we're struggling here? Or to come to us and say, hey, I see that this area is not right and you need to kind of help yourself there and, and let the Lord help. I'm not saying that that's not the case. But if the pastor has to always tell us what's right and what's wrong, I question a walk with God. You need to love God enough to focus on good things and abstain from evil things. Well, glory. And if you're absorbing too much of the world and not the word, clean up your act and get your heart right. It's that simple. All right, let's move to the last one. I'm not going to spend a long time here because it's pretty cut and dry, and I know it's 820. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1, we're made in the image of God. just want to explain our position on this. And uh, we were created to reflect to the world His image and His glory. Everything we do in our outward appearance reflects the image of God or an image of the world. So we have to continually look at each aspect of our outward image and make sure that we're shining forth His true light. In the Bible, a woman painting her face is noted as a harlot or a prostitute. Now, a woman would paint her face or eyelids specifically to attract attention or to entice someone. Never in the Bible does a woman paint her face to go into the presence of the Lord. You find the scripture, show it to me. I hadn't found it. But I have found it where they would do it before they go worship Baal. And I have found it where they would do it to attract the wrong attention. So in fact, 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, the wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The purpose of makeup is to alter a person's appearance to entice someone. It is a tool to draw attention to ourselves simply for the sake of vanity. We have to make sure that we're being careful to desire only the attention of God in our lives and be pleasing to Him. 2 Kings 9 and 30, Jezebel painted her face to try to entice Jehu and keep him from killing her. Somewhere in Jezebel's life, this ploy had worked before, and here she was at it again. Proverbs 6, the Bible speaks of the adulteress and not allowing her to take you with her eyes, letting us know this woman was trying to destroy something precious just by her looks. Jeremiah 4.30, says, When thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting in vain, shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. The person of whom Jeremiah is talking about painted her face, tried to make herself beautiful for her. I think it's interesting. He says, lovers. Tells you what kind of lifestyle she was living. Read Ezekiel 23, 40 through 49 sometime, not right now. The painting of the eyes, uh, again, I don't think I gave you that scripture. Let me say that again. Ex uh, Ezekiel 23, verses 40 through 49. If you want to read that sometime, it talks about the painting of the eyes being used to describe Israel and Judah as two adulterous sisters. Ezekiel 23, verses 40 through 49. In the word of God, the Lord always uses makeup in conjunction with the sin of lust. Remember, what's our purpose of holiness? To be accepted into the presence of God and to be holy as He is holy. Look at this. I never have noticed this till this week. I believe the Lord showed this to me. In the book of Esther, a young Jewish girl is among the candidates chosen to be the new queen. She endures separation from her family, a year-long purification process. And then it's time for her to go into the king. Esther chapter 2 verse 13 tells us, Every maiden's turn comes to go in to see the king. And before that, she's given the opportunity. You choose whatever adornment you want or felt you need. I got a feeling there were some pretty ugly girls that was trying their best to cover it up. I mean, they was using everything imaginable. Look at Esther 2 and verse 15. The Bible tells us she required nothing. I want him to like me for who I am. Not for who I try to make him think I am. Matthew Henry's commentary says this. He ain't even Holy Ghost feel. Look at this. She was not salacious as the rest of the maidens were, to set herself off with artificial beauty. She required nothing but just what was appointed for her, according to verse 15, and yet she was more acceptable. The more natural beauty is the more agreeable. There is nothing more beautiful than an apostolic young lady that knows God created me the way that I am. And it's more agreeable. This story is great with analogy to holiness. Esther's whole objective was to be pleasing and accepted by the king. Pause. Our responsibility is to be pleasing and acceptable to the king of kings. 
He created us after all. And we need to be careful not to pick up the ideas of the world in regards to beauty. And folks, that even goes, let me just sidetrack here just a second. That even goes, don't buy that that girl really is as skinny as she looks on the front of that magazine. There are computer programs that make them look like that. And we got girls today that are anorexic. They're not eating. They're trying to lose so much weight that they look sick. We've even got guys doing it. I'm not against losing weight and looking good, but at some point it don't look good anymore. You look sick. I go back. I go back, Brother Charles, and I look at some of my photos. I wasn't doing it on purpose. I had such a high metabolism, and marriage finally started agreeing with me and helping me. I looked pitiful when I first got married. My face was sunk in. Thanks to my wife's good cooking and fried okra, I don't look that way no more, you know. David, David acknowledges the perfection of God's creation. Look at what he says. I'm reading the NIV here in Psalm 13. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame, how my body's made, it wasn't hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me un, un, unformed, uh, saw my unformed body. All the, day, all the days ordained me for uh, me were written in, the, in your book because one of them, before one of them rather, came to be. In other words, God made us and knows how well we are made. We are each beautifully and wonderfully made. We must seek to draw his attention through our meek and gentle spirit, our praise and worship, and our love for being holy as he is holy. And so we avoid using the outward trappings of the world or their idea of beauty. In the 1920s when the movie industry began, I'm almost done, all pictures were in black and white. So to be able to make the actresses and actors' faces stand out, they had to apply enormous amounts of makeup. One actress in particular was famous for introducing the practice of wearing makeup off the set and into public. Her name was Theda Barra, and her nickname was Vampire. You can't make this up now, I'm telling you. She was given this name, not as it relates to the story of Dracula, okay? Don't go that far. But because she was said to seduce and destroy men on the screen. Movie theaters were packed each night to watch her vamp another young man. She influenced women of that day to throw moral caution to the wind, paint their faces with extreme makeup, go out on the town for a night of vamping. So any Christian should be able to understand we don't want that kind of influence to follow. We ought to reflect the morals of Christ and not the world. So the original use of makeup dates all the way back to the Egyptian times. A heavy, dark makeup called coal. I'm not preaching against coals. It's spelled the same way, K-O-H-L. Um, it was used to outline the tops and the bottoms of the eyelids. Any woman was made up in this manner, it signaled to men that she was a prostitute and was available. In the Bible, Egypt is a typology of the world and sin and slavery. So after experiencing God's freedom, why would anybody want to remain in bondage to the world and sin and be a slave to the world? God separates us to be His witness and His people just as He did the children of Israel. So I'm trying to help us to see that there is a spirit behind it that wasn't from God. It indicated a spirit of lust and adultery according to the word of God. The use of makeup even comes from a long history of prostitution and in the more recent past, the movie industry. God made us in his image and desires for our appearance to reflect his glory at all times. It's 830. I'm wrapping up. It's important that we understand there are motivating factors behind an issue and determine whether or not it's good for us to be involved in that issue. So I'm just showing you makeup has become a tool of Satan. And he's used it to convince women in particular they are not beautiful without it. They're not beautiful as God created them. God messed up when he made you. No, he didn't. No. I've even had ladies tell me, Brother Acey, I can't go out of my house without it on. I feel naked without it. And when they say that, Brother White, my mind goes back to Eve in the garden. She didn't feel naked till she sinned. They'll go to Walmart in their pajamas, but they got to have that makeup on. <laughs> My Lord. That's the, that's the situation in our world today. Here's your last blank. You've been waiting on this one all night long. Here we go. 
we got to be careful not to fall into this trap of worldly ideology. So we want our appearance to reflect the glory of God. Need a little extra shine? Let the Holy Ghost shine. What you'll find is there's a smile that is unlike anything else when the Spirit of God comes in. You can't fake that. I've had people tell me they got the Holy Ghost. And I would never tell them no. I never do that. No, I never tell somebody they got it either. I never tell somebody they got the Holy Ghost. I never tell them they didn't get it. I let them tell me. And if they tell me they got it, then I keep praying. If I don't believe it, I say, Lord, please, Lord, eventually let them get it, you know. I think if they're sincere, they will. They'll get the Holy Ghost. Seeking it. But there is, you can't fake the effects that the Holy Ghost has. And then to start showing in other areas. As we grow in God, we allow Him to lead in God. To stand together tonight. Appreciate you being here on Wednesday night. We want to talk. We want to close this out tonight and just asking the Lord to let His glory shine through us. Because the Bible says how that people are going to know that we're His children. They're going to see our good works. Our good works. Look at your neighbor and tell them, say, that means you too. We ought to all leave here doing good things. Yeah. But you know what? He says, you'll see your good works, but who are they going to glorify? The Father. Well, why are they glorifying Him? Because they see the glory of God through what good you're doing. I believe, and, and we're going to do some things in 2019. I was talking to Brother Donnie about it because he was working on the calendar and directory and all that, and I've got all that sent to him, and we're trying to get that ready for you by Christmas Sunday this year. I think that's the earliest I've gotten that out, if we can get it done. Uh, and and he'll, he'll do his part. He'll be waiting on the printer. But I was talking to him about what we were planning to do this next year, and, and uh he, he, he's standing there talking. He said, Pastor, I got chill bumps just standing here talking to you. I'm excited about it. You know, as we begin to do good things in our community, people's perception of church and the people of God will change. For too long, they viewed us as people that can't have fun and only concerned about what happens right here. But when we start lending a hand to our community and we say, hey, here's what we can do to help you. But you know what? What we're doing to help you is only temporary. But what God can do for you will be eternal. What good, what little temporary joy you receive out of me handing you a bottle of water or helping you with the food or whatever, that's only temporary. You're going to get hungry again. But what did Jesus say to the woman at the well? This water, when you drink of this water, you shall never thirst again. There is an eternal satisfaction that when the glory of God comes in, when God begins to do something great in our lives, there is nothing that can compare to it. Let's ask the Lord to help us to show His glory. Lord Jesus, when we walk out of here, we don't want people just to look at us and say, well, they're good people. We want them to glorify You. And through our holiness, without holiness, no man shall see God. You say to be peaceable with all men and holiness. God, help us today to reflect Your glory. I want to live holy before You as You are holy, God. I want You to lead and direct me. I want to be who You would have me to be, Jesus. And I thank You for the work you are doing. You're not done with me yet. God, I want to stay upon your potter's wheel. I want you to keep molding me and fashioning me with your hand today. In Jesus' name. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Let's worship together in closing. Hallelujah.